Welcome to the Bat al Fatou Mosque in London, the biggest mosque in Western Europe, for the 14th National Peace Symposium organized by the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community UK. Nearly a thousand people attend this unique event every year, including secretaries of state, ministers, ambassadors, journalists and academics, as well as representatives from numerous charities and faith communities. We live in a fragile world, a world that is rife with conflict and heightened tensions. As we desperately seek solutions that can bring lasting peace, the need for true justice becomes ever more apparent. And that is a the theme of this evening's event, the highlight of which will be the keynote address delivered by Hazrat Khalifatul Masih V, may Allah be his helper, the head of the worldwide Ahmadiyya Muslim community, who will inshallah be gracing this evening's event with his presence. Amidst the backdrop of global political instability, religious fanaticism, and even the recent attack on Westminster in this very city, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is taking the lead in promoting interfaith dialogue through events such as tonight's, bringing together people from all levels of society to promote peace. This is truly a much needed and unique event. And on behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community United Kingdom, we welcome you to the 14th National Peace Symposium 2017. Assalamu alaikum. Please be seated. Please be seated. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon you all. Welcome to the 14th National Peace Symposium of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community UK. We will start today's program with the recitation of the Holy Quran by Tayyib Ahmed Tahir, followed by its translation in English by Ataul Fatir Tahir Sahib. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كونوا قوامين بالقسط شهداء كُونُوا قَوَّامِينَ بِالْقِسْطِ شُهَدَاءَ لِلَّهِ وَلَوْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِكُمْ شهداء لله ولو على أنفسكم أو الوالدين والأقربين أو الوالدين والأقربين إن يكن غنياً أو 
فقيراً فالله أولى بهما The recited portion of the Holy Quran was from chapter 4, verse 136. The translation is as follows I seek refuge with Allah from Satan the accursed. In the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful. O ye who believe, be strict in observing justice and be witnesses for Allah, even though it be against yourselves or against parents and kindred. Whether he be rich or poor, Allah is more regardful of them both than you are. Therefore, follow not low desires, so that you may be able to act equitably. And if you conceal the truth or evade it, then remember that Allah is well aware of what you do. We now have a, a number of speakers uh, this evening, and first I would like to request the National President of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community UK, Mr. Rafiq Hayat, to do the welcome introduction. Rahim. Most beloved Hazur, respected parliamentarians, worshipful mayors, your excellencies, lords, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon you. Welcome to the 14th National Peace Symposium that is being held on the theme of global conflict and the need for justice. The past year has seen the world become even more fragmented and international division and tensions have become ever more apparent that there have been renewed focus on nationalism and more worryingly that was once in the realms of rhetoric has moved into the world of reality. The Brexit vote in the UK, the rise of nationalist sentiments in Europe, and the deeply worrying signs of the return to nuclear arms is threatening the stability of the world. Here in the UK, we have just seen very tragic events last week. And I would like to take this opportunity to pay our deepest condolences to the families of those who've lost their life in this very tragic event. And I would also like to take this opportunity to pay a tribute to our police forces who did an excellent job in being the front line against terrorism, and in particular, murder of a PC, Keith Palmer, who defended our democracy in this very hour of need. May God bless his soul and the soul of all the people who died in this tragic instance, and may God give solace to their families. 
And we hope and pray that uh, these, the people who were also injured during this incident, they recover uh, quickly and completely. Our community, the Amdiya Muslim community, will continue to play a part in the promotion of peace. And the main reason is because our founder, Hazrat Mr. Ghulam Ahmed, whom we accept as the promised Messiah and the Mahdi, came with a very clear and special mission to revive the true teachings of Islam and to reject the concept of violent jihad and to regenerate the link between man and God. The community has flourished and is now established in more than 270, 207 countries of the world. And our global work is being inspired by His Holiness, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, the worldwide head of the Amdiya Muslim community. And we are truly honored that he has joined us this evening and will deliver the keynote address. He has addressed parliaments across the world and most recently in Canada. His Holiness is a man of peace who leads a mission of peace and works tirelessly for the good of mankind based on unshakable belief in the compassionate and merciful God. This is the true essence of Islam and indeed all faiths at the time of this rising global injustice, it is a message that offers hope for humanity. I welcome you again tonight and hope that together we can work to guide the world from conflict to cohesion. Thank you very much. Our first guest speaker this evening is Father David Stanley, who is the chairman of Southwark Diocese Committee and is representing the Archbishop of Southwark, Peter Smith. We have received a special message from the Vatican for the event this evening, and I would like to invite Father David Stanley to read this message. Yes, my name is Father David Stanley and I come here as the representative of the Catholic Archbishop of Southwark, which is really South London. Uh, he could not come himself, but he's very happy that I should be here and so am I. So I bring his greetings um, and also this message from the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue in the Vatican in Rome. I have to say the Pope hasn't spoken to me personally himself, but I'm very happy to read this message from the Vatican. Your Excellencies and dear friends, it gives me great joy to greet each and all of you to this peace symposium. You are gathered for a reflection and discussion on peace. I congratulate you in the name of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue for this choice, aware as we are of the horrors of war and therefore of the immense value of peace. In this context, I would like to recall the message of peace of Pope John XXIII through his encyclical letter, Pacem in Terris, Peace on Earth, in 1963. That remains a masterpiece and a valuable teaching about this divine gift and at the same time the fruit of human effort. Let me offer you some thoughts about the four pillars of peace, truth, justice, love and freedom. Christians as Muslims believe that God is the supreme truth, al-Haq. As his creatures, at the same time believers in him, we consider it of utmost importance to behave according to truth, to speak the truth, to avoid falsehood and hypocrisy, mirroring in our conduct some of God's truth. This would enable the individuals, communities and nations to build among themselves cordial and peaceful relations. No peace without justice is not just a slogan, 
it reveals loudly the intrinsic relationship between these pillars. If you want peace, treat others in a fair manner, counter all kinds of injustice, because when people are treated unjustly, resentment raises anger in their hearts with the determination to re-establish justice, even sometimes having recourse to violent means. Love is not just a sentiment, it is born out of respect for the other, regardless of his or her identity, ethnicity, religion, culture, and political choice. Respect implies thinking well of others, speaking to them about with objectivity and looking at them with benevolence and treating them with, a, with tenderness. Love generates peace, violence generates death. Freedom is twofold, freedom from and freedom for. Liberty from pressures of all kinds, from oppression, from undue limitation of movement. But freedom is also freedom of conscience, in particular, religious freedom. I invoke God's blessing on your meeting for fruitful joint reflections and upon all countries suffering from violence and conflicts that they be blessed with his gift of peace. And this comes from Cardinal Jean-Louis Tarron, who is the president of the Pontifical Council for Interreligious Dialogue. And I'm sure if it had come a little bit later, he would want to give his condolences to the people of London and the United Kingdom for the events on Wednesday. I'm very happy to read this message and to wish you all well. Thank you. Thank you, Father Stanley. Our next guest speaker is Silvio Denio, who has traveled all the way from Italy to be here with us this evening. He's the executive director of Religions for Peace in Italy. He's a scholar in intercultural and interreligious mediation and has been with the Focolè movement, an international ecumenical movement active in 198 countries since 1959. He's a close friend of the community and we invite him to come and say a few words. Silvio Danio. Your Holiness, Mirza Marzur Ahmad, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, assalamu alaikum. It is a great privilege for me to stand here before you. I just want to share with you some of my personal experiences that uh, have uh, blessed me for the past 50 years. I had the great privilege to live in different countries ever since my youth. I have met people of so many different cultures and therefore also of so many different religions. I have learned not so much through books or through uh, talks or um, master degrees, but through friendship, through relationships, I have learned how to appreciate. I once discovered something very important, which I believe it is important for everyone who is uh, a follower of a religious belief and who is therefore also member of a culture. I could quote this golden rule, as it is expressed in so many religions, but it would be too long. So I just limit myself to three quotations. And I start with the quotation from the Hadiths of Nawawi Sunnah. And therefore it is a Muslim quotation. None of you is a Muslim until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. When it comes to the Talmud, 
that is something so precious for the Jewish believers, it says, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow. Because this is the whole Torah. Everything else is a commentary. When it comes to Christianity, it is quoted in different parts of the Gospels, but I just quote one. In everything, do to others as you would like others to do unto you. It is so beautiful to read it in Taoism, in, uh, in Sikhism, in uh, Zoroastrianism, and so on, and even in some philosophies which do not claim to be religions, but they are ways of life anyway. And, Your Holiness, I was thinking that in the global conflicts that we have in the world, and there's so much injustice and so much need of justice, if we, believers of the different religions, would be able to not only remind, not only to think of, but to practice this golden rule, probably the world would quickly change. And uh, I want to thank you, Your Holiness, in a very special way, because uh, listening often to your talks, to your very many interventions in many parts of the world, you have been not only a promoter, not only a uh, creator of what we badly need today, that is the culture of dialogue. You have been a champion of this, you have been an example, and uh, I conclude by witnessing that uh, everywhere in the world I have met the Ahmadiyya communities, not only I felt at home, and I, have, I must also acknowledge the fact that I am not a Muslim, but I felt among brothers and sisters. And this is something beautiful, something wonderful, and uh, this is what I am experiencing tonight here with all of you. And uh, the only expression that comes from my heart, which I believe everybody understands, it is in Arabic, but it's very beautiful. Alhamdulillah. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Shukran. Shukriya. Thank you, Silvio, Danio. Um, we have a number of dignitaries who are with us today, and I would just like to acknowledge their presence with us. Um, we have um, Siobhan McDonough, MP, who is also the chair of the Ahmadiyya Muslim All-Party Parliamentary Group, the Right Honourable Justine Greening, MP, who is the Secretary of State for Education, uh, the Right Honourable Tom Brake, MP, uh, the Foreign Affairs Spokespersons for the Liberal Democrat Party, uh, Paul Scully, Member of Parliament, uh, Lord Tariq Ahmed of Wimbledon, the Minister for Transport, uh, Lord Norman Lamont, uh, former Cabinet Member, um, and also a number of representatives from embassies across the world, from Kuwait, from the United States of America, from Iraq, South Korea, Japan, India, Ghana, Austria, Afghanistan, Angola, and uh, Canada, um, as well as a number of uh, mayors from various boroughs in Wandsworth, from Sutton, Rushmore, Bromley, North East Lincolnshire, Merton, and Elmbridge. Thank you all for your presence here today. And one message we have received is from the Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Theresa May, and I would like to just read that to the delegates here. She says, I am pleased to send my best wishes to all those attending the Ahmadiyya Community's National Peace Symposium 2017. The symposium is an annual reminder of your community's commitment to promoting peace around the world as reflected by the theme you have chosen for this year's event, Global Conflicts and the Need for Justice. I appreciate the important contribution Britain's Amethys are making to our country and warmly commend you for the good work you are doing to promote justice and tolerance across society. I hope you have an enjoyable evening, the Right Honourable Theresa May, Prime Minister. We've also received a message from the House of the Ma His Majesty the King of Spain, uh, who also sends their best wishes for the success of the symposium. We now uh, invite uh, Mr. Rafiq Ahmed Hayat to introduce the winner of this year's Ahmadiyya Muslim Prize for the Advancement of Peace. Mr. 
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The Amdiya Muslim Prize for the Advancement of Peace is an international award that was launched in 2009. It is awarded in recognition of an individual or an organization's contribution for the advancement of the cause of peace. This year, we are delighted to honor another wonderful devotee for her life's work, a lady who is a Hiroshima survivor and an inspiration for many in the international campaign for nuclear disarmament. Mrs. Satuko Thurlow was born in Japan and was just 13 years old in August 1945 when the devastating atom atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. What she experienced and saw was life-changing experience and having witnessed firsthand the horrors of death, suffering and destruction, she devoted her life to campaign against nuclear we weapons. She has focused on highlighting the humanitarian consequences of nuclear war and contributed to breaking the silence of people around the world concerning nuclear issues and initiated many anti-nuclear activities. Mrs. Satiko lives in Canada and is a Canadian citizen and has been recognized for her work by the Japanese and Canadian governments and has received numerous awards, including the Order of Canada Medal, the highest honor for a Canadian civilian. The Japanese government also has appointed her as a special communicator for the world without nuclear weapons, and she has addressed United Nations General Assembly First Committee. In a world that is increasing conflict and one that is edging very closely to nuclear war, the lifelong contributions of Mrs. Satiko is even more critical in bringing home the horrors of nuclear war. We are proud of her work and proud to recognize her effort to promote words of peace rather than weapons of war. We are delighted that she's traveled all the way from Canada, especially for this event, and we are delighted to present her with the Amdiya Muslim Peace Prize, and I would request His Holiness to kindly present this prize to her. Your Holiness, members of Amadea community, and distinguished guests, I am deeply grateful to be invited to this National Peace Symposium. In addition, it is a totally unexpected honor to receive your recognition for a lifetime of my service to my community as a social worker helping fellow Japanese immigrants in Toronto, Canada, and as a disarmament educator and global advocate for the prevention of nuclear war. This recognition and pride signify your support and encouragement for the decades-long efforts of millions of people around the world who desire nothing less than the prohibition and elimination of nuclear weapons to ensure real human security 
to the people of the world. In attempting to learn about your organization's history, mission, and activities, I learned with pain of your struggle and suffering from religious discrimination and persecution. Yet, in spite of it, you have chosen the principles of nonviolence, peace, and justice, and exemplify them in your daily lives through your motto of love to all, hatred to none. What an enlightened role model you are to the world community. However, we have been alarmed in recent years by the rising number of dangerous hate crimes motivated by religion and racism, largely targeted to Muslim and Jewish communities. Governments and citizens of the world must intensify our shared responsibility of combating such heinous crimes and protect human dignity and the rights of our fellow citizens. Tomorrow, I will travel to New York to attend the United Nations Conference for the negotiation for prohibition of nuclear weapons. This is an historic occasion that the majority of United Nations member states, 123 states, voted for. As one who experienced the catastrophic and indiscriminate atomic bombing of Hiroshima as a child, and who has been speaking out against such inhumane, immoral, and cruel weapon of mass destruction for the past 72 years. I rejoice that at long last, the world is making a significant progress to establish a legally binding treaty for the prohibition leading to the world without nuclear weapons. The voice of humanity has finally been heard. In closing, on behalf of the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki atomic bombing, and other victims of the nuclear age. I offer my heartfelt thanks for your commitment to a world of peace and justice. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Setsuko Thurlow. It now gives me great pleasure to invite our keynote speaker for the evening to address us, His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmed, the worldwide head of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. All the distinguished guests, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, peace and blessing of Allah be upon you all. <clears throat> First of all, I would like to extend my deepest condolences to all those affected by Wednesday's terror attack at Westminster. Our thoughts and prayers 
are with the people of London at this tragic time. On behalf of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, I wish to make it categorically clear that we condemn all such acts of terrorism and we offer our heartfelt sympathies to the victims of this barbaric atrocity. In all parts of the world, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community seeks to promote peace and in accordance with the teaching of Islam, raise its voice against these brutalities. This annual peace symposium is also an important part of this effort. I would like to thank all of our guests for joining us here tonight. The founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community said that he had been sent by God Almighty in this era in servitude to the Holy Prophet of Islam, Muhammad in order to spread the two paramount objectives of Islamic teachings. First, to bring mankind closer to God Almighty. And secondly, to draw the attention of humanity towards fulfilling the rights of one another. It is my belief that these two objectives are the bedrock for the establishment of genuine and long-lasting peace in the world. As Muslims, we are fortunate that the Quran has told us that the fundamental purpose of our creation is the worship of God Almighty, preferably in congregation, in mosques. Most regrettably and in complete violation of these peaceful objectives, certain Muslim groups or individuals have turned their mosques or madrasas into center of extremism, preaching hatred and inciting others to commit terrorist acts against both non-Muslims and Muslims who belong to different sects of Islam. Unsurprisingly, this has caused widespread fear in the Western world and created an impression that mosques are a source of conflict and disorder. It has sparked calls amongst certain parties and groups in the West for mosques to be banned or at the very least for some restrictions to be placed upon Muslims. For example, there are calls to ban hijab or for minarets and other Islamic symbols to be banned. Regrettably, some Muslims have given others the opportunity to raise allegations against the teachings of Islam. A Muslim is not only duty-bound to offer his prayers, but it is also incumbent upon him to take care of orphans, feed the poor, otherwise our prayers will be in vain. It is categorically mentioned in the Holy Quran, chapter 107, verses 3, 4, and 5. It is based upon these teachings that the Ahmadiyya Muslim community is, with, with the grace of Allah, running various humanitarian projects in order to alleviate the heartache and adversity borne by deprived people, irrespective of creed, caste, or color. We have established hospitals, schools, and colleges that are providing health care and education to some of the most impoverished and remote parts of the world. 
We seek no praise for these activities. Our only desire is to help such people stand upon their own two feet so that they can fulfill their hopes and aspirations and hence live contentedly with dignity and freedom. In this way, rather than becoming frustrated and prone to extremism, they will grow to be responsible and faithful citizens of their nations, where they will personally develop they will also help their nations progress and inspire others to follow in their footsteps. Similarly, fundamental to Islamic teachings is that Muslims must live peacefully with all other members of society and never cause them any harm or distress. Despite this, many people associate Islam with violence and warfare, even though nothing could be further from the truth. No matter what terrorists may claim, under no circumstances are indiscriminate attacks or killing ever justified. Islam has enshrined the sanctity of human life in chapter 5, verse 33 of the Holy Quran, which states, Whosoever killed a person, it shall be as if he killed all mankind. And whoso gave, and whoso gave life to one, it, should be, uh, it shall be as if he had given life to all mankind. What a clear and categorical statement this is. Often people query, why there were wars in early Islam. Similarly, they ask why terrorism is being perpetrated in Islam's name. In order to answer this question, I always cite two verses of chapter 22 of the Holy Quran, where permission for a defensive war was first given to the early Muslims. In chapter 22, Verse 40, Allah the Almighty states, permission to fight is given to those against whom war is made because they have been wronged and Allah indeed has the power to help them. In the subsequent verse, the Quran outlines the reasons for which the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, was granted permission to engage in warfare. Chapter 22, verse 41 states, those who have been driven out of their homes unjustly only because they said, our Lord is Allah. And if Allah did not repel some men by means of others, there would surely have been pulled down cloisters and churches and synagogues and mosques where the name of Allah is oft commemorated. And Allah will surely help one who helps him. Allah is indeed powerful, mighty. What do these verses prove? Certainly, they do not give Muslims the license to inflict cruelties or to seek the blood of others. Instead, they establish the duty of Muslims to protect other religions and to guarantee the right of all people to believe in whatever they desire, free from any form of compulsion or duress. Hence, Islam is that religion which has forever enshrined the universal principle of freedom of religion, freedom of conscience, and freedom of belief. Therefore, if today there are so-called Muslim groups or sects that are killing people, it can only be condemned in the strongest possible terms. Their barbaric acts are a complete violation of everything that Islam stands for.
Let it be clear that such people have no knowledge of the faith they claim to follow. For example, Mr. Seven Mary, a lawyer representing one of the terrorists involved in the Brussels and Paris terrorist attacks, recently gave an interview to a French newspaper in which he described his client as having no real knowledge of Islam. Indeed, when asked if he had ever read the Quran, his client readily admitted that he had not and had merely read an interpretation online. Furthermore, a research paper published by the Royal Institute for International Relations in March 2016 also concluded that the terrorists who identified themselves as Muslims had little or no knowledge of its teachings. Regarding the profile of young Muslims who have been radicalized and perpetrated attacks in the West, the, the report states their acquaintance with religion thought is undoubtedly, undoubtedly more shallow and superficial than their predecessors, as is their acquaintance with international politics. Further says, injustice was often a starting point with their predecessors, journey towards extremism and terrorism. This has now largely been overshadowed by personal estrangement and motives as the primary engines of their journey. Furthermore, in an essay cited in the Washington Post, the Belgian counterterrorism official Ellen Grignard said, their revolt from society manifested itself through petty crime and delinquency. Many are essentially part of street gangs. What the Islamic State brought in its wake was a new strain of Islam which legitimized their radical approach. Thus, non-Muslim experts accept that the terrorists have established a new strain of Islam that can only be described as a reprehensible distortion of Islamic teachings. Those who have adopted this new strain and are mercilessly killing, maiming, and raping innocent people are, according to the Quran, guilty of murdering all of humanity. On the other side, it is also apparent that amongst non-Muslims, there are certain individuals or groups who are fanning the flames of division and hostility and have made it their mission to unjustly defame and discredit the teachings of Islam. For example, in a column published just last week in Foreign Policy, the journalist Bethany Allen has written about a well-funded uh, well and sophisticated US-based network whose only purpose is to incite Islamophobia and to stop all attempts to promote the peaceful teachings of Islam. The foreign policy article states, a well-funded network is trying to strip the right to speak away from American Muslims and uh, fanning the politics of fear. America's far-right anti-Muslim ecosystem has adopted the same twisted interpretations of Islam that the Islamic State ISIS promotes. The author further writes that peaceful Muslims in the United States are the victims of an increasingly empowered industry of Islamophobia that constricts the space for balanced and open dialogue, sidelining the very Muslims who are doing the most to promote peaceful orthodox interpretations of Islam. She writes, the United States has powerful protections for speech and religious liberty, but 
the targeted network now seeks to deny Muslims that freedom and to treat Islam as a dangerous political ideology rather than a religion and to silence and discredit any Muslims who disagree. The article gives the example <coughs> of a peaceful Muslim convert in the United States. As soon as he gave a university lecture highlighting Islam's true teachings, a powerful lobby turned against him, trying to portray him as an apologist for murder, slavery, and rape. His family were subjected to death and rape threats. The university where he worked was inundated with emails demanding that he was immediately fired. Thus, such cases prove that there is a concerted effort taking place to influence public opinion against Islam and to prevent its true teachings from reaching a wide audience. Based on her research, the author concludes by saying, in the process, they are denying Islam the same functional rights that Christianity enjoy, uh, uh, enjoys and silencing the very people best poised to reconcile Islam with modern American life, which may be the very point. Regrettably, we often hear politicians and leaders making needlessly inflammatory statements that are beholden <clears throat> not to the uh, truth, but to their own political interests. For example, in a speech last year, when running for president, Dr. Ben Carson, who is now a cabinet member in the new US administration, described Islam not as a religion, but as a life organization system. Furthermore, speaking about the founder of Islam, peace be upon him, Dr. Carson said, what I would suggest is that everybody, everybody here take a few hours and read up on Islam. Read about Muhammad, peace be on him. Read about how he got his start in Mecca. Read about how he was seen by the people in Mecca, not very favorably. Further, he says, he has, how his uncle was influential and protected him. When his uncle died, he had to flee. He went north to Medina. That's where he put together his armies and they began to massacre anybody who didn't believe the same way they did. I agree with Dr. Carson, only to the extent that I too suggest that people take the time to read the true teaching, uh, the true character of the Holy Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him. If they study impartial texts, they will see for themselves that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was never involved in the massacre of non-Muslims and that such claims are a complete affront to history. The truth is that as a consequence of many years of sustained and bitter persecution, he and his followers were driven out of his hometown of Mecca and forced to migrate to Medina, where they lived peacefully alongside the local Jewish people and other tribes. However, the disbelievers of Mecca did not let the Muslims live in peace and instead aggressively pursued them to Medina and waged war, seeking to destroy Islam once and for all. It was at that critical juncture in Islam's history that Allah, the Almighty, permitted the Muslims to engage in a defensive war. This permission was granted as the verse of the Quran cited earlier attest. In order to establish the universal principle of freedom of belief. Hence, the allegation that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was a belligerent leader or a warmonger is an injustice and cruelty of the very highest order. And such false claims can only grieve the hearts of the millions of 
peaceful Muslims worldwide. History bears witness to the fact that with every fiber of his being, the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, sought peace and reconciliation. In this respect, you do not have to take my words for it. Rather, listen to what Ruth Cranston, a prominent 20th century author, wrote in, the, in his book, World Faith. Contrasting the defensive wars forced upon the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, with the nuclear weapons used during World War II, she wrote, Muhammad never instigated fighting and bloodshed. Every battle he fought was in rebuttal. He fought defensively in order to survive. She says, and he fought with the weapons and in the fashion of his time. Certainly no Christian, then she further says, certainly no Christian nation of 140 million people who today dispatches 120 helpless civilians with a single bomb can look askance at a leader who at his worst killed a bare five or 600. Thankfully, amongst a climate where it has become the norm to brandish Islam as a religion of extremism and violence, there remains some non-Muslim journalists and commentators who write with integrity and justice. For this, I commend them for swimming against the tide of falsehood and injustice that has become so commonplace. I would also like to highly commend our Honorable Prime Minister for quoting some verses from the Holy Quran, condemning the accusations that were placed on Islamic teaching in some of her addresses and speeches. Here, I should also commend a column written by Julia Ioff and published in Foreign Policy in which she examined the history of different religions, including Islam, and at the end concluded by saying, no religion is inherently violent. No religion is inherently peaceful. Religion, any religion, is a matter of inter interpretation, and it is often in that interpretation that we see either beauty or ugliness. I appreciate this impartial conclusion. As we try to pass through these uncertain and precarious times, it is my strong belief that criticizing one another serves no purpose and can only increase division and animosity. Instead, the need of the R is for us to knock down the barriers of fear that divide us, rather than erecting walls that keep us apart. We should build bridges that bring us closer together. Tragically, not a day passes when news does not filter in of further atrocities and terrorist attacks. Undeniably, the world is becoming an increasingly perilous place for Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Hence, we must stand up against all forms of oppression, hatred, and use all our capabilities to try and foster peace in the world. If we truly want peace, then the world's politicians, leaders, media, and parties must act with wisdom and grace. There have been many reports published that suggest that a significant number of Muslim youth have been radicalized because they felt a sense of grievance that their, their, their beliefs were being attacked and mocked in Western nations. In no way does this just justify or excuse them and they remain culpable and responsible for their actions. Yet, Common sense dictates that we should not pour petrol on an open flame. Rather, we should seek mutual understanding 
respect the beliefs of others, and try to find common ground. In this regard, the Holy Quran has laid down a principle of great wisdom and value in chapter 3, verse 65, where it states, come to a word equal between us and you. Here, the Quran has laid down a golden principle in the cause of peace, whereby it states that people should focus on those things that unite them. In terms of the major religions, the unifying figure is God Almighty himself. But this does not mean that a religious person can have nothing in common with a non-religious person. Thus, the Quran has taught us how to build a peaceful multicultural society where people of all faiths and beliefs are able to live side by side. The key ingredients are mutual respect and tolerance. Accordingly, at another place, the Quran has instructed that Muslims should not speak against the idols or deities of others because in reaction, <clears throat> in reaction they would curse Allah and a cycle of perpetual grievance would result. As you will be aware, the theme of tonight's event is global conflicts and the need for justice. And I have said for many years that the lack of justice has plagued every segment of society and fueled disorder. A lack of justice is also observed in the United Nations to the extent that even those closely affiliated with the United Nations openly attest to its shortcomings and its failure to accomplish its primary objectives, uh, uh, objective of maintaining international peace and security. For example, in an article published by the New York Times, the former United Nations Assistant Secretary General, Anthony Banbury wrote, I love the United Nations, but it is failing. There is too much bureaucracy and little result. Too many decisions are made for political reasons rather than following the values and objectives of the UN or by effects on the ground. He says, for the UN to continue and prosper, it needs a complete overhaul. And so an outside panel should examine the system and recommend changes. Similarly, during recent years, certain governments have made unjust and unwise foreign policy decisions that have had a very negative effect on the peace and stability of the world. A well-known columnist, Paul Krugman, recently wrote, also in the New York Times, about the 2003 Iraq war. He wrote, the Iraq war was not an innocent mistake, a venture undertaken on the basis of intelligence that turned out to be wrong. He further says, the public justification for invasion were nothing but pretexts and falsified pretexts at that. The reason I have given these examples is to illustrate that it is wrong to claim that Muslims are the sole cause of increasing conflicts witnessed in the world. Whilst it is undeniable that certain Muslim countries are at epic center of today's war and cruelties, it cannot be said that the rest of the world is united and immune from disorder. For example, there have been numerous reports or statements indicating heightened tension between the United States and China, and even the possibility of a war between them. Indeed, it, it was recently widely reported that a close advisor to the President of America had said that there was no doubt that a U.S.-China war would take place in the next five to ten years. Similarly, in January, the South China Morning Post quoted a senior Chinese military official saying that a U.S.-China war was now not just a slogan, but was becoming a practical reality. Likewise, tensions between Russia and the West continue to smolder and threaten to escalate at any time. Indeed, as tensions continue to mount, Germany's ex-foreign minister, 
Frank Walter Stenmeyer took it upon himself to speak out against NATO military exercises near the Russian border. Speaking, just he said, the one thing we should not do is inflame the situation with loud saber rattling and war mongering. He says, anyone who thinks a symbolic tank preyed on the alliance's eastern border will bring security is wrong. We will be well advised not to provide a pretext to renew an old confrontation. I agree with, this, with the statement of the ex-foreign minister that nations should not provoke one another or seek to assert their dominance. Rather, they should engage in diplomacy and try to resolve difference, differences amicably and without needlessly threatening each other. Sadly, with the passing of time, it seems that we are losing our ability to listen and to tolerate opposing views and perspectives. Opening the channels of communication and facilitating dialogue is essential. Otherwise, the world's malaise will only get deeper. Any way, I have cited various reports that suggest we are moving towards further warfare and bloodshed, both at an international and national level. We are seeing polarization and a hardening of attitude towards one another. Instead of pointing fingers and blaming one another, now is the time for solution. In my opinion, there is one ready-made solution that can have an instant impact and begin the process of healing the world. I refer to the international arms trade, which I believe has to be curbed and restricted. We all know that in order to fuel their economies, Western nations are selling weapons abroad, including to those nations that are embroiled in warfare and armed conflicts. For example, just a few weeks ago, it was widely reported that the new U.S. administration is signing off on a new arms deal for the sale of sophisticated and precision-guided missile technology to Saudi Arabia. Furthermore, a United Nations report published last year found that when it comes to the sale of arms, normal rules of law do not apply. It found that an array of companies, individuals, and countries had long been contravening an international arms embargo on Libya and supplying arms to different factions there. Hence, even where some limited rules apply, they are not being properly enforced. Whilst the primary interest of every nation should be the well-being of mankind and achieving peace, it is a sad truth that business interests and the pursuit of wealth invariably take priority over such concerns. Reflecting this narrow self-interest, a well-known well -known CNN host recently said that curbing the arms trade could result in a loss of jobs amongst American defense companies. During a live interview, he said, there's a lot of jobs at stake. Certainly, if a lot of these defense contractors stop selling warplanes, other sophisticated equipment to Saudi Arabia, there's going to be a significant loss of jobs, of revenue here in the United States. Furthermore, it is sometimes argued that the sale of weapons may actually encourage peace as weapon can act as a deterrent. In my opinion, this view is completely senseless and only encourages the further production and sale of extremely dangerous weapons. Indeed, it is such justification that have caused the world to become embroiled 
in a never-ending arms race. For the sake of the good of mankind, governments should disregard fears that their economies will suffer if the arms trade is curbed. Instead, they should think about the type world of uh, world they, they wish to bequeath to those that follow them. Many of the weapons being used in Muslim countries and even by terrorist groups such as Daesh have been produced in the West or Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe and so it, it is time for proper sanctions to be put in place which are effectively implemented. If this one step is taken, I sincerely believe it can have a very significant impact in a short frame of time. <clears throat> Otherwise, the, the alternative does not bear thinking about. I do not need to elaborate because the articles I have cited speak for themselves and point in the direction of another large-scale war. No country or group should be under illusion that they are safe because when wars start, they evolve rapidly and often unexpectedly. If we look back to the Second World War, there were nations who were determined not to take part but were eventually dragged into it whilst alliances and blocs continued to shift and change. Today, several countries have acquired nuclear weapons and if even just one such weapon is ever used, the consequences will be unimaginable and will live on, live on long after we are gone, rather than leaving behind a legacy of prosperity for our coming generations, we will be guilty of leaving behind only sorrow and despair. Our gift to the world will be a generation of disabled children born with defects and intellectual disabilities. Who knows if their parents will even survive to care and nurture them. Hence, we must always remember that if we seek to pursue our own interests at all costs, the rights of others will be usurped. And this can only lead to conflict, wars, and misery. We must all reflect and understand the, the precipice of, upon which we stand. We must recognize the purpose of our creation. As I said at the beginning, the founder of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, peace be upon him, came to forge a bond between man and his creator and to unite mankind. And so from the depth of my heart, I pray that the world comes to its senses before it is too late. My message to the world is to look at tomorrow and not just today. Let us leave behind a legacy of hope and opportunity for our children rather than burdening them with the horrific consequences of our sins. With these words, I pray that God grant sense to the people of the world and that the heavy clouds that loom above us give way to a bright and prosperous future. May Allah have mercy upon mankind. Amen. Thank you very much. His Holiness will now lead us in silent prayer. We pray by raising our hands. You may join us in any manner you feel comfortable. A silent, silent prayer. I mean, well, after the very tragic events on Wednesday, where we saw uh, a number of people killed in a terrorist attack, I think it's really important that communities 
show a, a, an open, tolerant, united approach. I think this is what this particular event is about. It's a peace symposium that the Amdi Muslim community organise every year, bringing people together of a whole range of different faiths and no faith to talk about some of the critical issues, so the, the global threats that we're facing, and really just showing that we can work together whatever community we come from. So I'm, I'm really pleased that this event takes place. You're a, a loving community. You preach about peace and love, uh, which is very important. And I see that you, you really show everyone that you are caring and loving. Uh, this is something special because people think that Muslims are not that open. But the, the importance of having the police here, having representatives from other communities, from other faiths, and just listening to His Holiness talk about the need for peace rather than war, the need for peace rather than conflict, is crucially important. These are very difficult times for all our communities, but community cohesion is important and what you do here adds value to our life. That message, love for all, hatred for none, is, is evident everywhere. In education you hear about themes, this is a living theme. The welcomeness that we are always given when we come, that feeling of joy that we have through peace is evident. Oh, me, yeah. Now I can say that uh, Azur is a real peacemaker. We must have more, more such a peacemakers around the world, and the world will be peaceful if we have some leaders like Azur. I was so impressed about uh, uh, what was contained in the, his speech that this is actually a message, not just to public. It's to the countries, including the big countries, that they should be aware of what is going on in the world. Well, I think it was his warning, I suppose, that um, both globally and indeed nationally, uh, we could face a, a rising threat uh, and that we should be united in facing that down. And obviously his message about how the Muslim, Muslim faith is, is one of peace and how Islam, if one, in, if one reads it effectively, properly and in depth, the, the message is that there isn't uh, an aggressive uh, side to it. And I think that is something that uh, the wider community as a whole uh, needs to appreciate. I feel it's uh, quite uh, impressive that so many persons are gathering on uh, the topic of uh, peace and disarmament. And I think it is a hopeful sign. Uh, and especially the motto of the Ahmadiyya uh, non-hatred uh, for anybody but love for everybody and it's excellent and it should be it should be incorporated in the united nations declaration